Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week. It is Friday the 13th. Oh, gosh. It's the first Friday the 13th in a long time, I think. I can't remember uh, doing the Critique of the Week every Friday. You kind of notice when it's Friday the 13th, and uh, that is it today. I can't remember when the last time was, though. But welcome. Gather around. Let's talk about some poetry. Um... Let's see who we got here. Katie Dozer's here over on Facebook, as is Andre Andrea Dobrika. Over on YouTube, we got a whole cast of characters. We got Dick Westheimer's here, Tom Barlow, James Langford in the house, Brian O'Sullivan's here, Cindy Gore, Nate Jacob, James Langford. I said that already. Terry R. D. Coleman. Good to see you all. So as always, um, the point of the critique was week is to give that workshop experience to people who might not have access to it. We want to want to help as much as possible. Um, talk about what works and what doesn't. Um, that kind of thing. And we always want to meet the poet at the, the place that they need to be met to help the most. The goal is to be as helpful as possible, uh, but also to, to just let the poet know what strangers think of their work because it's so it's so common to have, you know, show friends your work and they can't they don't really say anything that's honest. Um, and they also know your background and what's going on. If, if it's uh, somebody at a bookstore buying your book or a stranger on the internet reading your poem or in a magazine, they're not going to know what situation is around. So, so it's a very different experience than sharing a poem with people you know, actually. Uh, we don't know your style, your subject matter, or what might be going on. And, um, and so, because of that, it's really great to get uh, some, some feedback from people who are strangers. So we're going to sit around and just try to say, you know, what works, what doesn't, uh, suggestions for poems. Uh, leave any, as many comments as you can in the chat windows, and the poets are able to see that later. And um, we also have today, so Lisa Allison's a second poet. And now uh, Lisa's a great poet that we, uh, you know, uh, she's published a book already. Um, and she included some haiku. And I think this is the first time in the Critique of the Week we've been doing haiku. So look forward to that. We're going to do Lisa's second because she mentioned she's going to get home uh, about halfway through the show. So she's hoping it, it's uh, the second half of the show is her. So we'll do that for sure. Um, we're going to start out with a, another poet, Kea uh, Pellegrini is today's poet. Let's dive right in. So here is uh, Kea Pellegrini. She's got two poems here. We always do two poems. I should say, too, the way this works, um, if you'd like to participate in the critique, we have your poems critiqued. Just go to rattle.com, click on the submissions tab at the top of the menu, and go to submittable. And there you will see critique of the week as a submittable category. Um, submit two poems, and uh, we draw you out kind of at random as we go through the year. Um, but so let's take a look. And oh, I'm not on the screen. Here we go. That's better. Um, and also, I need to drink some coffee. I haven't drank coffee yet. I should probably put my coffee away from the the document. Okay, so poem number one is "Old Soul," and here we go. Old soul, mature I was for my ripe, tender age of childhood due to the tremendous and concerning situations. My soul aged older than usual, than what I should be, than what I should have been. No mind of clay deserves a life of that kind of suffrage. Violence domesticated borns a soul older. So uh, that's first from Old Soul. And um, there's a nice rhythm to it. The, so you can see, we talk a lot about the... Um, the way the the length of the lines play out and, and, and change the way you m make you read and uh, short lines I, I feel like it's always a I feel like it's a pace car because uh, you know the white space around makes the words sort of stand out more and it makes you kind of want to read it but a little slower every time there's enjambment you kind of you have to pause a little bit as your eye scans back so that kind of slows the reading down and makes the focus more on word to word and makes the reading process a little slower and all the white space around the page makes um it enhances that experience too and so we get a, a nice slow poem with that kind of slow rhythm here with those short lines and they, I think they, the rhythm is really nice for the content too um, 
So, old soul. Mature I was for my ripe, tender age of childhood. So, there's something really interesting going on in this first this first stanza. Um, the uh, Anytime I see for my ripe, the next word I think is probably going to be tender. And I don't, I hope it's not tender. Um, let me turn this. <laughs> let me turn this down a little bit. Um, that's better. Um, and yeah, so every time, oops, there we go. So, so, you know, it's, it's a cliche and it's, it's a, it's the kind of almost the, the worst kind of cliche. Cause if it, when a cliche comes in a list like that, um, you really, like, the problem with cliche, I mean, we talked about this with, um, me and McGilchrist, um, a little bit, but, um, um, Ian McGilchrist uh, does the right left brain research um, and um, it, about the two different ways the brain functions. There's two sort of two, you're two people almost. You're, you're a right brain, you're a left brain. One looks at it holistically and one looks at it very specifically and narrowly and doesn't see the big picture. That's kind of the gist of uh, McGilchrist's work and what he dissects in his book, Mas The Master and His Emissary. And what really happens is a cliche. Um, so a metaphor is some kind of really interesting connection that the right brain, which is the more creative side of you, um, makes. And so you make this connection that sort of makes the world a brighter, more interesting place. But then when you've repeated it so often, it becomes its own phrase, like its own chunk of stuff. And it doesn't light up the whole brain in the same way. It's not as stimulating. And so when you have a, a phrase like my ripe, tender age, um, that's a phrase that you've seen so many times that you don't even think of the word ripe and then tender and then age altogether. It used to be a, a something that like evoked image. Um, but now, since it's a list that's a cliche, it's something that you only see as my ripe, tender age, as if it's a whole phrase of a concept rather than an image. And so it doesn't evoke all the, the, all the, the image lighting up in your brain and all the feeling that comes with that. And so that's why you want to avoid cliche. Just a really general reason is because it doesn't stimulate your, your mind in the same way. Um, let's see. Voice is still not clear. Tim says Tom Barlow. Still hot mic or some other issue. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Maybe is it is it better now? <sighs> yes. Every time I log in, it maybe it's just too hot. Maybe I'll turn it down more. Is it better? Someone tell me if it's better. Um. But yeah, I, I think I don't know. Lately, every time I come into um to OBS, the the volume settings change every time. I don't understand what's going on. Um, that never used to be the case. I think that's better now, right? No, it's not better. Hmm. Let's see. Still a fuzzy sound. It's fuzzy. Hmm. Hmm, let's see. Even less gain. How about how about now? Does that that does that help? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure. It's like yeah, it's like super it's like the hottest it's ever been. <laughs> and um I'm not sure that's better. Okay. Okay. So maybe Something happened. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. We're better. Thanks, everybody, for helping me out. Um, I'm glad it's the critique of the week and not the rattlecast. Good now. Yeah. I'm not sure what the issue was. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, anyway. So, what I'm saying is, is cliches end up chunking the language. So, you end up seeing a phrase as a concept rather than the images that are inside it. And so, something like the ripe, tender age is a really great thing that evokes a lot of um, thought and feeling and, and image. Uh, the first time you come across it. But when you come across it over and over again, it just becomes this sort of concept that doesn't evoke that. And that's what happens here um, for, with my ripe, tender age. So once you have, you know, you, for my ripe, if you're going to have a poem that's stimulating, you have to have a different word than tender. Um, it's okay, not great. Hmm. That's weird. I wonder if I jinxed it because I was, um, I was thinking about how this microphone's now, uh, four and a half years old and I wonder if I ever have to replace it. Maybe it, uh, maybe it died or something or maybe something, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway, I think, I mean, that's the best I can do right now, but it's okay. Um, so anyway, 
So, um, yeah, so if you have ripe, you, you can't do tender as the next word because it's not going to be stimulating unless you, unless you want people not to be stimulated and, and engaged, but, but that's what you want to do in a poem. So you need the ripe. Uh, you need something different than tender. But the interesting thing here is that you do what you could do is done here. So age of, every time you see age of, you think something interesting or, or something, something like um, a number is going to appear, right? But instead, we have the age of childhood which is an interesting way, interesting turn there. And so that's the way you can turn something that would be sort of a, a linguistic cliche into something more interesting. It's by saying the age of childhood, where you're, we expect the age of 13 or something, you know? So, um, so that's an interesting thing because, um, yeah, so let's continue. Due to the tremendous and concerning situations, my soul aged older than usual, than what I should be, than what I should have been. Um, and so here we... Um, the tremendous and concerning situation. We don't talk about the situ the, what the situation is, but we, we hint at it and we see something that's going on. Um, and so, um, and so a lot of times we talk about the, the need to have a place and, and figure out what the poem is doing, but we kind of know what the poem is doing. Something, something serious happened. We don't know what, but there's, it's a difficult childhood that's making me age older. So we kind of get the story already at this point. Um, and uh, as Dick West points out, coming up on abstractions, situations, and soul. So if that was the only abstraction, because we kind of get a hint toward the end of what it is, the violence domesticated borns a soul older. Um, if we, if we, um, we, we get an idea of what it is later. And so hinting at it, like, like foreshadowing it now is, is okay. Um, so I think that's, that's fine. But then we get to my soul aged. It is... Um, 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 yeah, as Dick said, it's, it start to become um, abstract and, and not having that sense of engagement. So what we want is is people who are going to be hearing, you know, reading poems, reading your story, listening to your voice as strangers. Uh, what we want to do is um, is is know what the story is, and we really don't. We don't get a lot of like details to go on. We, we're we're trying to like build a mental space with the poem. We're trying to create a stage, and we're not really getting that when we get my soul aged. Um, and not, not explaining the situation. <clears throat> so here, um, due to the tremendous and concerning situations, this is where we would want the poem to turn and explain what those situations are. Like, due to the tremendous and concerning situations, my mother doing this, or my brother this happened, or this accident happened, or whatever. That's where we want, would want to dive into the actual story. But instead, um, yeah, instead we don't uh, we don't get the story. We sort of just get the same thing that we already established, where I'm I'm old for my age because of the situation, older than usual than what I should be than what I should have been. No mind of clay deserves a life of that kind of suffrage, and um, I think as uh, Tom Barlow points out, I think you know suffrage is the right to vote. So I think that's the wrong word there, just by accident. I think it means you know, I think it meant to be suffering. No mind of clay deserves a life of that kind of suffering. Um, and there's a nice rhythm to this too. So if we if we say that we're supposed to be suffering, it's just a typo. Um, then um, no mind of clay deserves a life of that kind of suffering. There's a nice rhythm to that, and there's a nice sense of conclusion there, or like a, like a turn feeling to that. Violence domesticated borns a soul older, and so we get the soul again. We repeat the soul again, and, and the soul is a sort of empty thing. We, we we need to hear more details about what's going on. So for this poem, um, you know, it, it's there's um. Uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is um, public versus private poems or, or personal poems in our way to think of it, um, where th there's a poem that you're writing for yourself because you know your situation or you're giving it to somebody. Um, and it feels more like that kind of poem than a poem where we would be as, as strangers knowing what's going on and really feeling a connection to it. What we need as strangers is the story. We need something. We need to know the, the context. We need images and details so that we can build this sort of universe in our brain and understand um, what's going on so that we can feel what's going on and um, and the fact that we don't get the story here makes it there's not a lot to connect with I mean we feel you know yeah so Dick Westheimer says the poet really wants to tell us more about the trauma it seems but feels it would be too dangerous and that that might be the case and, and maybe I mean if, if it is dangerous to write a poem too um, maybe the poem shouldn't be written there's there's that too so um, um, but but for a poem for for sharing and publishing like that um, getting the story out, letting us know what's going on, and, and then so we can connect and, and relate to it, um, and, then, and having details and images and so we can build scenes in our mind and experience it too um, is what's missing. 
Uh, but the poem can still do great work as a personal poem in helping you get down on paper the things that are going on and what you want to say to yourself. Um, there's a weird way that just seeing you write something tells other parts of yourself that aren't conscious of what's going on, what you think, and, and you learn through that. There's uh, a lot of research into the healing powers of writing, and I think that applies to this kind of stuff. This kind of personal poetry um, allows people to, um, you know, f get that feeling of, um, you know, have those things connect and, and yeah. Um, and when Dick Westheimer says um, dangerous, uh, he means in dangerous in terms of the personal emotional experience for the poet, not physical. And and yeah, that, that could be too. So so dangerous in that way, um, in, in that way of just just engaging the actual situation might be hard. Um, I mean, that's something you have to decide why you're writing. I, I think you can. I do think that that a poem can be healing to you personally if you don't go into detail about what you're talking about. I think that can work on a personal level. It's just hard to get an audience to, to follow along and, and, and feel along with you when you don't know what's going on. Okay, so let me look at, uh, I haven't looked at YouTube, and I'm sorry for the audio problems today. Let's see. Sharon Fronte says, I would not even use the word soul. Try something different. Yeah. Um, Sherry Poff suggests some concrete picture of how a soul can be older or appear older would be helpful. I learned to get my own dinner. I had to sign my own permission slips. Yeah, those are the kind of details. So even if we don't reveal the story that we're talking about, the details like, I mean, you could personify the old soul. You could, you could turn it into, you know, what does it look like? Um, you know, and, and, or Sherry Poff says, what, what do I actually do that, that shows that, that my, um, you know, soul is old. Like there's that whole show don't tell thing, and the whole thing is because showing it lets us experience it too as readers. And so we really want to want to feel and, and see evidence of that, see details of what's going on, rather than just saying what is it, say having it described. Because having it described, we can't engage on that level where we become be, become you as a speaker. That's what we do when we read a poem, and we're not able to do that unless we're creating a space with with details that we can sort of build the world around and then enter it and become the person who's speaking. And so so we need more details. Let's look at the other poem and see if that's a similar situation. Um, the other poem is the same way. And again, this is a, these are poems by Kayla Pellegrini. The same way. If I ended up falling so hard, so hard that I shattered into indigestible pieces, would you still see me the same way? If I was much less, much less than a stanza in a poem out of a, the book, would you still love me the same way? Read my poems the same way. Hear my songs the same way. If I showed you the unorganized state I lived in, if I showed you the piles of pungent laundry on the floor, if I showed you the months of old, months old dishes in the sink, if I showed you the purple bags sagging below my eyes, if I showed you the countless missing assignments, if I showed you, if I told you that I purposefully missed classes from no sleep, if I told you that I had uninvited and disturbing thoughts, if I told you that I wished I could go back to being a child, if I told you that I stopped writing creatively from burnout, if I told you that I masked my emotions in order to protect myself, if I told you that, if I told you every truth, if the human who I was before was no longer me, if I change, would you love me still? Because I changed, will you love me still? The same way you loved me when I was a ray of sunshine, when I lit up your day, your life without having to shadow any truth. Suppose no one will read me the same way. And that is uh, the second poem, the same way. We get the same way as the ending and also the title. Um, and there's interesting if the poem's long enough, you know, the the title having the title being the same as the ending, a lot of times that detracts. But if you can forget the title by the time you get there, sometimes that can work. Um, so, you know, it, it detracts because you've already seen it before. In the same way that, that the cliche, the first time you come across a phrase or an idea is the most powerful, and then when it's repeated, it's less powerful. And so it weakens. Oftentimes, it weakens the ending um, by having the 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 title be a re repetition of the ending. Um, but, uh, in this case, I don't know, in this case it's long enough where I kind of forgot that was what the ending was. So it's not as, as much of a problem. Um, 
Yeah, so Joe Bugger says uh, repetition can sometimes work really well. In this case, could the author use less repetition? Um, yeah, so let's talk about this section down here. Because this is interesting, because this is the kind of thing that Sherry Poff was talking about with the other poem, where if we had details, and, and feel how the poem comes to life more in this section. Um, even though the repetition is sort of too much, um, yeah, as uh, Nate Jacobs says, there's lots better imagery imagery here. And it's because this section lists out things. And that's what the other poem was lacking. If we could have um, a series of, of things like this to describe that, that feeling of being an old soul, then the poem would come to life. So it's a great example of, of how that does it. Um, for the repetition, um, so, so what you have to understand about human beings is that we're pattern recognition machines. And we like to we love, we get a lot of, we get a little, little dopamine hit, a little reward every time we recognize a pattern and then it's confirmed. But then once we have the pattern established, we, we become habituated to that. We understand it. It's normalized. We don't get a reward anymore. And so what you want to do is with repetition is there's, that's, that's why, one of the reasons why there's the rule of three in art is because we get to feel a pattern emerging. Um, and so you need, you know, you need three dots to, to see that it's a line and a lot of times an image or a, a thing like we're drawn to a sense of three because that's when we can sort of get confirmation of the pattern with one with one point we we don't get anything because we don't know where it's going to go a second point we can see a line emerging right and then the third we're like yes that was the line and we get this little reward but then the fourth we already learned that we don't need to and so um and so that's why you know when when things repeat they have to have enough um, they have to have enough variety in the repetition to keep being stimulating or else if, and so the, the issue here is that if I showed you, uh, is repeated one, two, three, four, five, six times, um, and that's just too many times for us to stay interested in that. And eventually what we start doing is just skipping over it. Like the fact that I had to read out loud was a little bit of a, you know, normally if you're just reading a book and you saw repetition like that, you would, uh, just, just sort of skip to this part. So, um, yeah. Um, so, so if I showed you the, let's sound much better. This feels if we, if we did it more like this, if I showed you the unorganized state I lived in, if I showed you the piles of pungent laundry on the floor, the months of old dishes in the sink, the purple bags sagging below my eyes, if I showed you the countless missing assignments, if I showed you, so if we cut out these two, um, and then you get you get the pattern, but then you break the pattern a little bit, then the pattern reemerges. Then we get all that feeling of the, we get a positive feeling of how, um, uh, of how the repetition is working. And so that's the kind of thing you have to have variety within repetition to keep us engaged with it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. And it's so the same thing. If I told you that, I purposely miss classes from no sleep. And then since you're doing two, two stanzas in a row, you'd want to vary the way that you do the variation too between these two stanzas. So it's not the same. Like we, we want, we want pattern and then we have deviation from the pattern so we can learn new pattern. And that's, that's a way that we stay engaged with things and not bored. Um, so if I told you that I purposely miss classes from no sleep, that I had uninvited and disturbing thoughts, if I told you that I wish, you know, so if you, if you skip like maybe the second one, if you skip this one and this one and this one or something like that, then that would be a, a different pattern, but we would still get the sense of repetition and that, and that, and we'd be drawn in a little bit more, but the details are really good throughout this. Um, um, so, um, yeah, so piles of pungent laundry on the floor, the months old dishes in the sink. I think somebody pointed out that those kind of concrete details are what really make a poem come to life because we get to sort of feel like we're within the space of that speaker that's in a, that we become you and then we have a lot more empathy and then we have a lot more emotion for what's going on by, by being able to enter the poem through the details. That's why details are so important. Um, okay, so um, yeah, if I told you every truth... Well, I haven't, we haven't looked at the beginning. Let's look at the beginning again. The same way, if I ended up falling so hard, so hard that I shattered into indigestible pieces, would you still see me the same way? And so we have this you, and we don't know who the you is. And this, this, this one, because it has a little more detail, it's a little more easy to follow and, and become part of it. But it does have the same sort of personal poem feel, where this would mean a lot more to the person who knows, like it's written to somebody. And the poem would mean more to the person it's written to than to, to us as readers. And because they know the context of the situation that we don't really get. And so again, like we were talking about before, um, this poem as a, as a something to give to somebody has a lot more value than to give to an audience of strangers on, in a magazine like Rattle. 
Um, so you have to decide what you want to do with poems too. Um, and yeah. So, um, so, so if we want it to be a poem that, that addresses, you know, an audience of people who don't know what's going on, then we have to add a little bit to, to make us understand the situation a little more and, and add a little bit more context so that the can, uh, so that we can be aware of what's, what the situation actually is and then we can feel the poem a little more strongly. So, so I would, you know, work on adding some more context here. If I was much less, so, so, and you can do that in the title and in the title, since this line repeats, um, you know, we could, we could info dump and add information in the title to make it so we know who the you is to make it so we feel engaged and know what's going on right away. Um, and then the and then the title in the same way at the end would would feel a lot better too, having it not be repeated. So what I would do is add the situation here in the title, and you can do that by saying like "dear lost friend" or or you know just some something like that, so we know who the you is, um, and then that makes the poem come to life a lot more too. Would you still see me the same way if I was much less, much less than a stanza in a poem out of the book? There's a really nice, uh, the line breaks are really nicely done, and the rhythm is really great. So there's whoever whoever um, you know, Kayla clearly is someone who reads a lot and has a great ear for language. So um, um, it, it's a kind of a joy to read. Um, if I was much less, much less than a stanza in a poem out of the book, would you still love me the same way? It's really actually difficult to have, you know, these poems with no punctuation feel really natural and be easy to read. But this is here. Read my poems the same way. Hear my songs the same way. Then we get this run. And as people are saying um, in the notes... Yeah. So a good lesson, uh, Laurel Benjamin says a good lesson on repetition would be um, Nikki Giovanni's writing lessons. It's a good model, which uses anaphora, but less repetitively. And um, Attractive Face says, I love the imagery and the concrete details. I can feel the anxiety in the messy kitchen images. Yes. And so this is where the poem comes to life. If I showed you, you know, we have the um, unorganized state I lived in, the piles of pungent laundry on the floor, the old dishes in the sink. So this is where the poem is really coming to life for us as readers because we get to feel and experience it. The purple bags sagging below my eyes, the countless missing assignments. I purposely missed classes for no sleep. I had an, um, that I had uninvited and disturbing thoughts that I wished you could go back to being a child. Um, so here... So, so this is a super strong way to do a list with these kind of details. We, we get to paint an image in our head. This list is less less detail oriented, which is why if you look at the comments, people haven't brought up that, that this is a, this is an, as engaging as the dishes in the sink. Um, so if we could find more more concrete details for here, this would be a little stronger section too. Um, if I mask my emotions in order to protect myself, if I told you that, if I told you every truth, there's a nice way too. So so this every truth is a good a good change. See how that's, it, it takes what's being repeated and changes it. And that's a good way to, to add stimulation. In the same way, the, um, in the last poem, that um, uh, the ripe tender age of childhood made it more interesting. Um, you know, in the same way that is, that, that change up from what you expect makes the poem sort of connect more. So if I told you every truth there, that, that's nice. If the human who I was before was no longer me, if I change, would you still love me? Because I changed, will you still love me? the same way you loved me. When I was a ray of sunshine. So the, the ray of sunshine is a cliche. We got to get rid of that for the same reasons we talked about before, um, <laughs> despite my terrible handwriting. Um, but, but cliche is we don't actually see the image anymore, so we don't get to feel it. Um, when I lit up your day, your life, without having a shadow of any, having to shadow any truth, suppose no one will read me the same way. Yeah. Um, Okay, and then Jacob says, I like the me without my mask theme for a, for a love poem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I think we've covered this poem pretty well. The The end... Um, I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's a statement. You're giving a message to somebody in the poem. And so the end works, I think, pretty well, too. So it's just bringing in more images and, and seeing who you're writing for. Are you writing for, are you writing for the person that you're going to, you're actually the you in this poem? Is this a poem you're going to give to them? Or is this a poem that you're going to have other people read? And, um, and if so, give us a little more details and, and more setup. Let's move on. It is 930 Let's move on to uh, Lisa Allison's poem. So Lisa Allison, we talked, she's going to have haiku in a little bit. Um, 
But we're going to start with this poem, the old or the woman knitting on the bus, on the seven a.m. bus. I'm sorry. Here, clean up my papers. Okay, so this is Lisa Allison again. Where'd she go? There she go, Lisa Allison. The woman knitting on the bus. <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> the woman knitting on the seven a.m. bus. And like I said, Lisa is an experienced poet. What is her book? Um, let me just give her a shout out to her book. Um, yeah. So here's Lisa's website. And this is um, her award winning book, Good Mother Lizard, uh, right here. And it's always fun to have poets who are more established, too, as well as just starting out. Um, yeah, so Good Mother Lizard was uh, uh, the Headlight Review Chapbook Contest winner recently. So, um, yeah, so check that out. Her website is lisaallison.com. So um, here we go. Let's look at these two poems, by, or this uh, first poem and then the, the haiku series by Lisa. The woman knitting on the 7 a.m. bus. Look at her hair, wild in the sunrise as she clickety-click knits a red scarf, maybe for a grandchild, ignoring the world when the bus breaks down, when passengers groan, when a young woman in heels yells at the driver whose whole body shakes as his hands pump air as he pleads on his speakerphone for assistance. The driver's voice folds like an umbrella. May be a while, folks. You can wait for the next one. We all launch on to the icy street, the young woman shouting into her phone, her high heels catching on the steps, a yawning man, one hand on his toddler, hoisting a stroller through the snow, me hoping I'll make it in time to my mammogram to find out my future. We go, 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 except for the woman with the sunrise hair knitting on the bus already there. Now, that's a very nice poem already. The woman knitting on the 7 a.m. bus. And, and you know, see how we, you know, we dive right into images. The woman knitting on the 7 a.m. bus. Look at her hair wild in the sunrise as she clickety-click knits a red scarf. It's a very nice description opening the poem. And so we're, we're already, we know we're on the bus um, we know there's a woman knitting. We, then we look at her hair. We get this the detail, the wild and the sunrise. So, it, you know, we know it's 7 a.m. bus as she clickety-click knits the scarf. So we get the sounds in there. So we get, we get all the senses engaged right away. We know where we are. The, the who, what, why, where, when thing is going on. We don't know as a speaker. Um, we assume we're a, a passenger on the bus at first, I'd say. And then we end up being that. Um, you know, but we could be, you know, we could see her driving by too. Um, but it turns out that we're on the bus as well, but we get a real sense of, of place and what's going on. Um, she knits a red scarf, maybe for a grandchild, ignoring the world when the bus breaks down, when the passengers groan, when a young woman in heels yells at the driver whose whole body shakes as his hands pump air, as he pleads on his speakerphone for assistance. Um, so this section, I thought that the description of, um, of, of the scarf and the clickety click because we get the uh the sounds too was really strong the um i don't know I, th I feel like it's not as strong in this section um describing the bus driver the the passengers groan i like the passengers groan i should probably move this little little thing down but when a young woman in heels yells at the driver the whole body shakes as his hands pump air um like like those details um those details the, the, their work is concrete images, and they help propel the poem along. But but they're not as interesting as the the wild and the sunrise that kind of flourish. So I feel like those could be like pumped up a little bit and be a little more interesting. Because um, other other images too throughout the poem are, are more interesting too. So it's kind of a weak spot that I could you could sort of think of better, more interesting ways to say these things. I think, you know, pleading into the speaker. Um, you know, there's there's not. It's not as, orig as an original way of describing that as could be done, even though, you know, we've already passed to the gotten up to the step of, um, um, you know, having really concrete language. So um, and, and we're engaged. It's just that, that the it doesn't live up to the quality of the rest of the poem, I'd say. So I, I could you could find better ways like, you know, because the, the driver's voice folds like an umbrella. I mean, that's so much more stimulating than he pleads into the speakerphone for assistance. So how could he plead into the speakerphone? What could he do? Um, how could we describe that in a more interesting way? 
Um, that's the kind of thing, the, the next level type thing to be thinking about in that section. The driver's voice folds like an umbrella. Maybe a while, folks. You can wait for the next one. We all launch onto the icy street. I think I think that should be on too, right? Um, I gotta put up the comments again. Let's see what everyone's saying. Um, so Benjamin Barr mentions omit the three whens here, and I think we 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 just talked about the rule of three, which and applies here. So since it's three, it's the right kind of number for a list. It's sort of lame that you <laughs> that three is so universally important. But it's just true. That's just the way we function. And so when the bus breaks down, when the passenger's growing, when a young woman in heels, we, we get a little bit of reward for that. I think it's a good use of repetition there. Um, and so and if it was four, that would be too much. But it, but the three works fine. And I think I think it works. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Um, Joe Bucker says that they're not needed. Um, there, there's different ways you could do it. So one of the poets that I love, um, and I love it for this reason, is Alan Shapiro. And if you look at any Alan Shapiro poems, he's just such a master of using surprising, strange um, um, syntax and twisting things around. And if you can, if you can, you know, this is sort of a straightforward way of telling a thing by by listing it out. If you could find a way to say it, and you know, um, where you're sort of spinning around the the sentence structure, um, then you can the poem can be interesting. But it, it's still more interesting, I think, having that repetition than just saying when the bus breaks down and the passenger's groan and a young woman in heels. I think the when, the repetition of when is better than an and or a comma would be. So I don't know. Um, let's see. A lot of comments are going on here. So Terry R. suggests... Yeah, okay. so Dick West ever says, um, the, f the folds like an umbrella seems forced. I know you like it, Tim, but to me it feels like it's out of place. And I agree, and it's because it comes after something, you know, descriptions where it's not it's not using, you know, figurative language that way. And it, it's a very, a very, um, yeah. And so what Deb T says later, or Terry R says, yep, I think it would work to skip right to the description whose voice folds like an umbrella after yells at the driver. Yeah. So, so if we, I think it's the the contrast between having a really sort of a simple way of describing things and then moving into really highly figurative language that feels off. It does feel forced the way it's presented here. I I agree, um, but it's still a cool line. Um, I also was wondering about this is debut. I was also wondering about skipping or shortening the section with the whens. I agree, it's not as interesting as the rest. Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe, you know, we could we could just cut it down to as another option. For this and then get right into the, uh, the the voice folds like an umbrella and then it wouldn't feel as out of place because we'd be going from the the wild it's the same kind of flourish as the wild and the sunrise um, um and then we shift down to a really simple speech and maybe we could condense this too i mean you just want to condense down the, the least interesting things and then and then and then the, the the most interesting things stand out and so maybe might may be a while folks you can wait for the next one um do we even need to know that? Um, like, like, what if we, what if we sort of paraphrase that instead of had it written out? Um, the driver's voice folds like an umbrella. Um, I don't know, telling us it may be a while. I mean, just that simple. And then we don't have the. It, it doesn't take up as much space. Then we all launch onto the icy street. So something like that, like there's, you know, when you have things that are less interesting, like just condense them it, it, to, to as little as you need to keep the story advancing. Um, we all launch onto the icy street, the young woman shouting onto her phone, her high heels catching on the steps. I think it's a nice little detail. Um, but again, the shouting on the phone is similar to the, um, the pleading into a speaker phone um, and, and that it's not described in a really interesting way. Um, Let's see. Um, a yawning man, one hand on his toddler, hoisting a stroller through the snow. See, hoisting a th stroller through the snow is a much more interesting way of describing something than just shouting into a phone, which is bordering on cliche. It's just a very natural, simple way that we don't really get a lot of that, get a lot out of. But hoisting a stroller through the snow has a lot more vivid detail, and so that's the kind of thing that I think the the phone and then the section up here could do a lot better about. 
Um, it, so it could live up to, to lines like that, which are really nice. Me hoping I'll make it in time to my mammogram to find out my future. Um, and then, so of course, this is the heart of the poem right here is where we find out who the speaker is and like where the speaker's going and, and how that relates to, to this situation around it. Um, I feel like there's a, might be a, a more streamlined way to say that me hoping I'll make it in time to my mammogram to find out my future. I mean, I really love the, the way that it's laid out. Um, hoping I'll make it in time, you know, cause it's, it's sort of answering our questions, which is like a mind reading trick almost, but, but it's like hoping we'll make it in time to what? Oh, to my mammogram. And then the, the actual significance of that added on top of that too. Yeah. And Deb T says, I like the way the mammogram brings it into the future. I do too. I wonder if it's, there's just um, a quicker way to even do that. Then the, the, to find out phrase, I, I wonder if there's a way to, to, you know, I mean, could you just say, I mean, hoping I'll make it in time to my mammogrammed future or, or something like that. I mean, maybe you need it to pause there. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, exactly. So Dick Westheimer says that to find out my future is not as powerful and maybe and more ambiguous than it needs to be. And, um, and yeah, so how would you, I'm, I, I feel that too. And that's what I keep pointing out, but I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to think of how you could phrase that in a better, in a more interesting way. Um, hmm. What if it was like, um, um, like what if we, we focused on the idea that, that, that it's like two futures, you know, um, or, or possible futures, all my possible futures or something like that, where, where the, the sense that it was, um, you know, that, that, the it's a fork in the road of your life. This mammogram is sort of highlighted. So it was like hoping I'll make it in time to my mammogram in, in, in all of those possible futures. I'm not sure exactly how to say that, but something like that, that can add a little more to it. It is, it, I don't know. I feel like it could be done more. So I wonder what, what you think, Dick, do you have any ideas? Um, but we'll move on for now until while Dick's thinking about that. It's his assignment for right now. Then we go, 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 except for the woman with the sunrise hair knitting on the bus already there. And this this rhyme, I mean, I like rhyme. And so this rhyme is nice. Um, and I think it really adds a sense of closure to the poem. Um, the, the go, 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 I, I think the go, 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 it feels like the impetus, uh, the reason for doing the go, go, go is that it, it, it you know, the, the poem went kind of heavy right here. And, and by using a phrase, like phrasing it like we go, go, go is such a casual way. It sort of brings it back into a lighter space. Like, oh, it's not so bad, reader. Don't worry about it. Not, it's not a poem about me dying. Um, and I think that works too. So um, so I, I like that that decision there. Except for the woman with the sunrise hair knitting on the bus already there. And she's already where she wants to go. So it's a nice little, um, almost, we have haiku later. It's almost a haiku type um, last stanza. Um, Terry R says, I think it could allow the reader to come up with the idea that this mammogram determines the speaker's future. Wouldn't that be more powerful? And I think it would too. Yeah. Um, but, but I think it might happen too fast to, to give us time to, to think about it. The way the poem is sort of paced me hoping I'll make it in time to my mammogram. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this This is a really the key to the poem, and it seems a little bit, um, yeah, it just seems a little bit, bit off, even though it's like the real real key to the poem. So Dick says, uh, what to do with the mammogram line depends on the context. Is it routine? Is there a lump? Um, Lene Harper says, to picture my future. Yeah, how about, yeah, what about that? Like the, uh, the picture of my future. I mean, because it is an image. Um, what if it was like me hoping I'll make it in time to my mammograms image of the future or something like that? I don't know. It, just something a little more. Hmm. Yeah. It's a good suggestion, Linnea. Um, over on Facebook, let's take a peek at my future. Um, says CeeLo Innes. Um, and Andrea Dobrika says to an x-ray my future. Um, overall, Potter O'Donohue says, I like the way this moves right along and like the bus and tells us so much with so little. Yeah, it's a very con you know, condensed little poem. It's nice. Um, so Nate Jacobs says, the tension of this poem needs more space. That mammogram shift shifts the sense, should shift it, but goes back to the bus. I like the shift. 
Yeah, so Cynthia Simps is to my dreaded mammogram. And that would tell it too. Um, hmm. Yeah, we're just kind of brainstorming here. But it is. Like, that's, the, that's the key to the poem. Because that's the turn where the poem could go to a, a, a deeper, darker place. And, um, and then it goes back without it. But I kind of like... I mean, one of the things that I really like about the poem, I love the way that it's sort of, like, like Potter said, that it condenses and tells a story, and, and sh you know, a whole story in a few words. Um, and, um, and, um, and I like the, the, what it's talking about, with, which is this, on this bus, there's so many people going off to do their own things. Like, like we all have our own worlds that we're, we're living in. And, and for this woman, the knitting is the world. But for me, it's this mammogram that I'm heading to. And for the, for the man with the toddler and his stroller, it's, it's trying to hoist the kid through the snow. Um, and I like the, the way that all these different lives are swirling around this one bus in this one moment. I think that's a really, it's a nice, nice setup for a poem. And it's a nice story to be telling and nice to focus on the, the woman. So I, I, I like that aspect of it. I mean, not every poem has to go super dark. Yeah. Yeah, Sharon Fry says it's a wonderful poem. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I might disagree with Nate too, personally. Um, sorry, Nate, <laughs> but uh, I think I, I think the the let's not get too dark turn after the quick turn. I think that's the right thing. I think it just I mean a tiny bit more right here, and and that's really the key that's going to unlock the poem. I think. Um, hmm. Yeah, just one one change right there. Let's see. Um, D. Coleman says my second mammogram or repeat mammogram. Yeah. Deb T says make it in time to my mammogram, which in which future it will show. Brian O'Sullivan says in time for my mammogram to see through time. Yeah, I, I think, I, I to me I think. I, I like this sort of general shape of the poem. I think it works really well. It just does need a little bit of expansion, like one more line or just more detail on this line um, to, to make that come to life. And then we can move on, move past it like the people on the bus do. Um, okay, I think we're going to move on. That's about all we have to say. Interesting poem. I, I like it. I like a lot of the details of it. The woman knitting on the 7 a.m. bus. Okay. Now let's move on to the uh, haiku that Lisa sent. And I do believe this is the first time anyone sent haiku for the critique of the week. Um, so we'll sort of look at them in, well, I, I guess we'll read them all, and then we'll, we'll talk about them each individually as we go through. So after the fight, cold night walk, our unsaid words condense. New Year's Eve, icicle midnight, even the sharpest year melts. And then these are titled Untitled Haiku. Distant Starlight, My Ex Lover's Kiss Still Burns. Halo Moon, How Our Love Refracts. Night Walk, The Pine Broken Moonlight Carries My Shadow. Dusk in gray and Myth Gray. Dusk and Myth Gray, The Mute Hour Between Us. And then to Motto Q here um, Ocean Undertow, The Tug of Grief. Cupping quietude, the antique moon. Yeah. Oh, the night is to discern the shape of my future. I like the shape. Yeah, it's a little late for coming back to that, but I do like the shape instead of the, for that. Um, to my mammogram, to discern the shape of my future is what she says. I, I like the idea of it being a shape. Um, but anyway. Um, so, so for haiku, um, the, the tendency or the, the tradition is not to title haiku and, and most people don't. And, and it's because, um, really what a haiku is, is a poem in one breath. And, um, and the, the convention to do a long, a short, long, short is, is sort of the basic way to do it. Um, and, and I think of it, I think I've never heard it actually put this way, but I think of, the, of a haiku as, um, two worlds in one breath. That's how I would define haiku. And so, because you have the sense of, it's like the basic unit of our understanding is metaphor. And a metaphor is really comparing two things to each other. Um, and that's kind of what a haiku does. It's sort of like a, a, a one breath metaphor poem where things are combined together in an interesting way that makes us see the world a little bit differently. And then that's when we get that sort of haiku moment that we call it, which is just a, a sort of a new understanding that, that smushing this metaphor together does. Um, 
and and you know so haiku in japan has this long history of the the kigo the season words um and and you know and, and that we can't do that in english because every word doesn't have a season in 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 our tradition um, people have tried to make an english language kigo dictionary so we could but it's just not part of the tradition that we care about but what we have found and what makes english language haiku so interesting is that the the heightened use of that um that that cut that that um um that sense of two things happening at once, the, the ancient pond frog jumping into the water sound, that, uh, that, that ancient pond being something different than the, the frog because the, the ancient pond is timeless, but the frog is right here with a splash. And the, the contrast of those two things happening at the same time um, says something really deep and interesting about the timelessness of, of the universe and how everything is, is here even though it's gone at the same time. And there's that, that really strange feeling that it conjures and that's what that ancient pond um you know frog jumping into water sound um, or however you want to translate it that's what that poem does and it's that two worlds in one breath like we're and that's why it's short enough for one breath and that's why kind of the 575 in english is too long a little bit too is because it's it's a little too long for one breath because haiku in um um, because in Japanese, it's not a syllabic language. They use um, a mora, which is a time kind of thing. And really short, long, short is a better way to think of it than the, the syllables. Um, and because that's too long. Um, yeah. So anyway, so so the thing, so <laughs> that's a long way of saying, the, the thing about the adding a title to a haiku is it sort of almost makes it not a haiku anymore. Because... Um, because it adds like a third element when instead of having the whole thing existing in one breath, these two universes in one breath, we have this second breath, which is the title. And so, I don't know, without a really good reason, I would, I would avoid na um, titling haiku. And so after the fight is the title here. So it's, it's giving us information. Um, cold night walk, our unsaid words condense. And so, you know, because it's a cold night walk, um, that's sort of a doing double duty you know, because we're cold to each other um, and it's cold out. So we kind of get that sense already with the first line. And then our unsaid words condense. And and because it's a cold night night walk, we can know, we know that we're talking about cold, a cold feeling and not like, you know, if it could be warm night, our unsaid words condense. And then um, it would be a totally different poem. And so... Um, yeah, and so what I I would just cut this. I don't think it needs a title. I don't think we need to know it's after a fight because I think that's contained in cold, and then and then what cold means for our unsaid words and, and condensing them. Um, so I think I think that's all told within the poem, and I would just cut that. But I think it's a great haiku otherwise because you get the cold night walk, then the cut here. That's the one world. Our unsaid words condensing is the second world. The the loneliness of the cold night walk where we assume we're we're not speaking even if we're walking together we're not speaking. There's a lot of emotional power. I think it's just a really good haiku. Cut the title. Um, and probably I think the same for New Year's Eve. Let's see. New Year's Eve, icicle midnight, even the sharpest year melts. Yeah, and so Deb T says the, the haiku doesn't, first haiku doesn't need a title. Yeah, it just doesn't. And I think for this one, I, again, wouldn't want the title because of the same reason. It sort of almost makes it not a haiku if it has a title. Um, and because um, it's no longer one breath. And, and that's sort of the whole point of is condensing it down to one breath. And so if you said, um, instead of um, icicle midnight, if it was, um, you know, pull this down. If it was, it was uh, New Year's and cut the eve too. If it was New Year's icicle, even the sharpest year melts. Um, I think that's a much stronger haiku. Then you don't have to have the title. And um, so that's what I would do with this one. New Year's icicle, even the sharpest year melts. Um, yeah, and I think it's a really great haiku too. If we do that, if we just drop the titles, um, so both of these are, are there just for the title. And I wonder, I haven't read much, you know, I do like to read Frog Pond is the, um, the Haiku Society of America's journal. And it's great because they have, um, if you go to, is it just hsa.org? What is the Haiku Society's website? H Haiku Society. Um, frog pond. Let's see if you go to um, oh, it's hsa haiku dot org. Um, but they have Frog Pond, their journal there. Let me show this on screen. So this is Frog Pond, the journal of the Haiku Society of America. And if you go to um, hsa haiku dot org, you can find this, or just just type in Frog Pond Haiku. 
Um, but what's nice is they have previous issues. And you can go down here. Um, they have samples for, for recent issues. But wait, going back in their archives, um, they have complete PDF back issues of tons of, of um, tons of old issues. And they have a lot of essays, too. So I've read a bunch of the essays because it's always an interesting thing to do. And there's just tons of haiku here, um, great examples. Um, but what I was saying is I've never seen an essay um, about the use of titles. So I wonder, I don't know what the haiku community thinks, but just to me, the title takes away so much from the haiku that I'd, I'd avoid it. Um, and the untitled haiku work better. And what we usually do with a submission at Rattle, by the way, because we do, we try to publish haiku. Uh, we don't get a whole lot of submissions uh, of haiku. I, I, we did that haiku issue, the Japanese forms issue, and, and we're hoping for more to come in because of that. A few people picked up on that and started sending us. We get a lot more haiban, which is um, prose mixed with haiku, than we do just straight haiku. But if we get a haiku submission, the whole idea of it being four poems is thrown out the window because it's just, you know, four pages of haiku would be great. And then we go through and just pick the ones we like. And then we have like seven haiku or something, which, you know, happens once a year at least. So um, so I'd love to see more haiku. And, and just submitting them in a, in a bunch of haiku somewhere is a really good thing to do. So Distant Starlight, My Ex-Lover's Kiss Still Burns. Um, Distant Starlight, My Ex-Lover's Kiss Still Burns. And again, this is a great structure of a haiku, um, you know, um, Lisa clearly knows what she's doing in writing haiku. The one thing, um, yeah, there's something really interesting in this in this that I like a lot, and it might be too esoteric, but but the idea, you know, of course that that the stars, the light that's shining from the stars, the stars might be gone by the time it gets here, um, if they're distant enough, and so it raises a question if that star really does still burn. Um, at the same time as it's saying it does in the in the poem. So we have the cut here and this, which is probably true, but maybe not, which is fascinating, but it appears to be true. And then the ex-lover's kiss still burns. Um, and a great use of the, the line breaks and, and, the, and the length of the poem, too. So it's definitely, you can hear that. It's one breath, distant starlight, my lover's kiss still burns. So another great haiku. I, I mean, it's, it's, I don't have much to say because these are great haiku. Um, but I like that a lot. I like all three of these once we take out the titles of those. Halo Moon, Our Love Refracts. The one thing I find reading a lot of haiku is just the um, the, the use of um, the moon is, is just so prevalent, and, and especially the season moon, like winter moon, which I, you know, I have done too. Um, Halo Moon is, a, is an interesting, a different one that you don't see very often. Um, Halo Moon, Our Love Refracts. Um, I think this, to me, this one isn't as strong as the other ones. Halo Moon, our love, how our, sorry, Halo Moon, how our love refracts. Um, and I think it's because refracts, I'm not sure how to take that word. Um, you know, because refracts means to split apart. And, and then there, you could either read that as a positive or a negative thing in a way that, um, makes it hard to sort of connect with it to me. So I think maybe for that one, the refracts doesn't work as well. And maybe that's something to, to work on. Halo Moon, how our love refracts. Um, and so Katie Dozier already says refracts instead of rings. Yeah. Halo Moon, how our love rings. That would be interesting. Yeah. And that gives us one direction to go on instead of that sort of ambiguity. It's an ambiguity that is so big. There's like such a vast gulf in the ambiguity of refracts to me that I don't know how to take the poem. And it, it's not the kind of ambiguity where it's like, oh, it's interesting. It could go one way or the other. It's like so far 180 degrees in a different direction um, that that it's hard for me to feel. But but maybe that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, it, it depends. I'm curious to see what other people think. The, but the rings idea, you know, because there's a halo around the moon, um, and then rings has that double meaning too of ringing, but but the ring around the moon and then the wedding and all that stuff. So that that goes together. So that that be a way to go one direction with it. Um, let's see. So someone asked a question. It's hard to find. Unfortunately, the way I gotta find it. Someone said, um, "Tim, what is your perspective on the contemporary dot dot dot?" And I have to find. Where the actual question is. Um, oh, Tara McMahon says that. 
and that was just three minutes ago. So, so we talked about it a little bit, but I really rushed through it quickly. So five seven five. We were talking about how haiku, um, even in the Japanese, haiku is a, a poem of one breath. That's the whole point of haiku. And in Japanese, it's just a mistranslation of what's going on when when haiku was first brought to the United States or, or to the the English speaking countries. We have this strong idea of what a syllable is. In Japan, there's something completely different. It's a moraic language. And so the sense of, of what things are is based on time, how long you say things. Like the word haiku for us, um, haiku is two syllables. Um, but for, in, um, in Japanese, haiku is actually three mora. It's um, ha ai ku Or maybe it's even four. Is it three? I can't remember. It's either three or four. It might be even like, I think it's three. But um, but but it's the it's the length of time you take. So if it's a long stretched out syllable, that ends up being multiple mora, and so five seven five is really is in syllables is way stretched out much longer than it should be, and so it makes the the poems especially wordy in a way that doesn't work with one breath. So it's just too long, and since we don't hear, we're not our ears aren't tuned to hear the length is mattering as much as it is in Japanese. We don't have that sense of it. So to me, what I like to do is um, I like just shrink, shrink it down just personally to um, like something like f- like four, five, four or three, six, three and keeping it that short, long, short, um, but um, making it fewer syllables. And I think that's the, the best way to do it, in my opinion, because then you still get some kind of sense of structure. Um, but it's not too long structure that like kills the idea of a haiku in the first place. So, so that's what I would do. But, but other people have, have just completely abandoned it. And also interesting too, there's this whole thing called Jendai haiku, which you can read about in um, issue 47 of Rattle, the long conversation with um, Richard Gilbert, who's a haiku scholar living in Japan. He's been teaching um, um, literature in Japan for like 20 years. Um, and he's been sort of translating and bringing to life contemporary poets and, and, Contemporary or, or haiku poetry in Japan has had the same, um, you know, modernist revolution that we did, where we adopted rhyme or we, we got rid of rhyme. We had, you know, we had, uh, um, you know, postmodernism sort of turned everything on its head and we, you know, free verse came out, William Carlos Williams, all that sort of stuff. That the same thing happened in Japan. And so, so contemporary poets in, in Japanese haiku um, don't use even 575 mora anymore. Um, and, and, you know, they've, it's, it's almost like saying it's not a poem unless it's iambic pentameter or something um, when you say it's 575 because in, J- in Japanese, they've gone like a free verse route too. So there's like multiple reasons why <laughs> there's no reason to do 575. Um, okay. So. Um, but that is the 575 issue. Don't do 575. And, and even the, um, um, there's a, there's a there's a um, national haiku writing month that I, I don't know if it's the poetry the haiku society does I can't remember who does it but their symbol on, on their Facebook group is um, five seven five with a with a no circle through it like no five seven five because um, and Michael Dylan Welch who we should have as a guest on the Rattlecast um, he runs that whoever whoever he's affiliated with and um, and he explains why it's it's not that you can't it's just that that please don't <laughs> because it's just wrong. And and that's and it just ruins haiku, I think. Um, but some people, but but when it came over, it was um, translated that way, and so people started writing it that way, and it kind of took on people like counting syllables in elementary school to teach kids what syllables are, and um, and so we learned that, and it's sort of the bane of of you know haiku poets' existence that five seven five is a thing that is a concept, and so so avoid five seven five. Um, but there are, you know, I mean, language, literature evolves and, and styles and poetry always evolve and people have embraced that. Billy Collins really likes the, the 17 syllable length for a haiku. Ellen Ginsberg made up the American sentence, which is a, a single sentence at 17 syllables, a sort of a honor of the haiku, supposedly, um, all in one sentence, though. Um, so there's different ways. I mean, you can do it. It's not that you can't do it. It's just um, in, in haiku, I would, you know, it's not doing what a haiku is supposed to do if it's at that length, usually. So, um, anyway, let's keep moving on. So, Halo Moon, how our love refracts. I think there's just too ambigu- much ambiguity in that. I think that's the first one that, that needs some work. Nightwalk, the pine broken moonlight carries my shadow. Nightwalk, the pine broken moonlight carries my shadow. Um, yeah. 
So um, let's. I'm trying to look at the the way the comments nest here. Yeah. So so yeah. So um, Katie Dozier has an idea. Pine broken moonlight carries my shadow. Instead, yeah. There's something about the pine broken moonlight that's a little too much. And um, what how I would do it. Um, I would do Pine Broken on its own line. Pine Broken, the moonlight carries my shadow. That's what I would do. Then it would have a nice nice cut. So Pine Broken, the moonlight carries my shadow. That's what I would do. So, um, oops, like that. So Pine Broken, the moonlight carries my shadow. And then, and then you have that sense of two worlds going on because Pine Broken is one uh, world. And then the moonlight carrying my shadow is another world, and you get that that two worlds jammed together, which is that that haiku moment that we get to feel that that two feet, you know, that that uh, you know, one foot on the border of one world and one in the other, um, that we we feel that experience of interestingness. And and pine broken is a really interesting phrase because there's that sense of pining for someone, but that's broken. Um, and then pine broken with the moonlight is really interesting too. So combining that together and we get all these things jumbled up. So I like pine broken. The moonlight carries my shadow. That's what I would do with that one. Um, I didn't finish saying, I think that the contemporary, if you look through frog pond or like modern haiku, those, those journals, um, they don't even stick to long, short or short, long, short for the lines. Um, there are a lot of things that go long, short, long, you know? And, and so it's like the middle line is one word. And in haiku, oftentimes haiku are just written in, J in Japanese in one line anyway. So, and we kind of you sort of sense where the breaks are yourself. Um, so you can you can write a haiku however you want. It doesn't have to be short, long, short. Although that's the the, the best convention. Um, so pine broken, the moonlight carries my shadow. I think that's great. That's what I would do. Um, and great suggestion, Katie, for for spinning me off in that direction, even though I modified it a little bit. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, so Katie said Pine Broken Moonlight carries my shadow. I think the is important. That's what that's the difference. I think because the allows it to be a separate sentence where Pine Broken Moonlight becomes too connected. So so that's why I think um, I'd keep the the um, and then put carries my shadow on its own last line. Um, OK. Yeah. So let me keep looking at comments. Um, so Cindy Gore says, I remember Roberta Beery sang 575 on the Rattlecast, though, or did I get mixed up? She was mentioning contests, etc. Yeah, so um, I think she was saying that, like, when you do a haiku contest, and you're, she's the judge of a lot of contests, Roberta Beery, she was on about a year ago. Um, and she's most, um, she, The Unworn Necklace is a great book of hers. Um, for storytelling through haiku, if if you want, if you have to get one book of haiku by a single author, I would get the Unworn Necklace by Roberta Beery. Uh, it's the best one I've read. The other thing I'd love, I, I think, is great is that that Gendai haiku uh, website that Richard Gilbert puts out because you can see all the possibilities of of how far it's stretched in a sort of a modernist way through there. Um, so that's another resource if you're interested in haiku. Um, um, Tambala says is enjambment often used in haiku. And, and yeah, it is because that's the enjambment is a way to sort of trick. Uh, you especially see it ironically in the um, the monoku, the one line haiku. But when you play with enjambment um, as a way to like like bridge the worlds together, it's almost like. And in in um, in Japanese, they actually have um, characters instead of um, punctuation. So um, I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but it'd be like a word that means a comma. Um, and so and so that's why you have a, you can have like one string of uh, one sentence one breath um and you don't need punctuation even it, it's really interesting but um but the enjambment is a way to like like it's the way those two it's it's where the the cut is the kariji um it, it, it jamming across that space and so usually if you have a three line haiku which is the standard form um usually i mean one of the two it, one of the two line breaks is like the big cut between different ideas. But then you play with the fact that it can, 
you know, just like enjambment does, you can play with it, you can read multiple ways. And then that's one of the things that sort of brings it out to life and becomes surprising and stimulating is that it can go either way. Um, anyway, let's look at the next. There's there's three more. Let's let's go. We're, we're 10, 12, 12 after the hour. That's okay. Dusk and myth gray, the mute hour between us. Dusk and myth gray, the mute hour between us. And so I think... Hmm. I mean, myth gray is hard to see. Dusk and myth gray. The mute hour. I like the mute hour between us. But to me, like this is sort of similar to the refracts, where I'm just not sure what to make of it in a way that doesn't let me uh, like access the feeling of the poem. Um, so what... Um, yeah, I don't know what to make of myth gray. Hmm. The mute hour between us. Yeah, this one I'm I'm just not getting a whole lot. However, I'm not sure how to um make it work. Yeah, Terra says myth is an abstraction. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see if anybody has any ideas for this one. Yeah. So Katie Dodger says these are all great, but not seeing only this one. Yeah. Here's um some suggestions. Joe Barker says dusk in my mouth. That's interesting. Dusk in my mouth, the mute hour between us. I like that. That's that's much more evocative than uh Myth Gray. The Myth Gray just feels off. Um somebody oh yeah, Sharon Fronte said I would say I would just say dusk, yes dusk the mute hour between us i think that that doesn't add enough though it feels kind of flat without something more i like dusk in my mouth so jenny middleton says myth gray means an almost real time hmm <laughs> so potter donny says donut in my mouth dry now time for coffee <laughs> that's funny speaking of which this is how this is how little coffee I've had yet. I need more. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I mean, to me, it's the myth gray. This doesn't, you know, it was something better. I like the dusk in my mouth. That's a really interesting idea from Joe Barca. I like that a lot. Dusk in my mouth, or dusk in the mouth, or hmm, dusky gray says Benjamin Barr. Um, Katie Dozer suggests dusk the gray mutes between us. Dusk in the mouth. Hmm. I don't know. So play with that. Play with that. Um, and figure out. It, it's just that needs some some work. So it's it's more interesting. And then down to the monocou. And the monocou are really interesting. Talking about that enjambment because ironically that that sort of shows how enjambment works in haiku um, because it's like taking the two worlds and just smashing them together. Um. um so one of my favorite monoku is that that pretty sure my red is your red and and the way that the the pretty sure the, the cut is between pretty sure and then my red is your red is a separate thing but it works together in one sentence even though it's two separate things and it really mod one modifies the other a lot and um and so that's the way that they, things cram together um ocean undertow the tug of grief um ocean undertow the tug of grief i like the concept a lot um Because the tug of grief is like an ocean undertow, like always pulling you down. I think it's a great metaphor. Um, but but to do a for a monocle, like I was saying, like like smashing the two together in a way that works is is usually the the best way to go about that type monocu. And um, and and so there's something that could be could be improved because we have the. Ocean undertow, the tug. So it, the interesting thing is the poem kind of overlaps. Like we have the tug of grief, but then ocean undertow is also a tug. And so there's this kind of like overlapping. The tug is like being dual used. Um, it's it's being used two ways to talk about the undertow and the grief. And we're sort of tugging both both ways, um, which is really interesting and a great thing. But the syntax isn't doing that. And so that's why it's sort of missing something. So if you could rearrange this. Um, hmm. Yeah, Sharon Fronte says take out ocean. 
Hmm. Yeah, I think it might be better without Ocean because we know what an Undertow is. Undertow, the tug of grief. But but unfortunately, the, just the way that that phrase would go in English has the... Um, like the... Like what we want to say is the tug of undertow and of grief too. Um, but but there's a way that it makes it really difficult. Undertow, the tug of grief. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just the only way to do it. I do like it. Um, Katie Dutter says, I feel we need ocean to start with an image. I think undertow kind of is an image though because it conjures the ocean on its own. I think I would, I would pull... Um, so Joe Barker says no need for the tug, which is interesting. What if uh, <laughs> what if we we uh, I accidentally put the tug in parentheses? What if it was undertow parentheses the tug and parentheses of grief? And then we have this weird sort of uh, E. E. Cummings thing where we're going. We can read it many ways. Undertow of grief. And then the tug is in the middle there, being tugged apart. I kind of like that, but maybe that's too uh, esoteric. And uh, Richard Gilbert would like that a lot because he likes the, uh, the the deep language play. Um, but what if that was the poem? Undertow, the tug of grief. Um, that'd be interesting. I don't know. There, there's some way, if you could have that, that the tug become like a fulcrum, like some, some kind of pivot, then the poem would be even stronger. Although I, I got to emphasize, I, I really like it anyway. Um, Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so Joe Barker just says undertow of grief, which works, but the, I like the tug in there too. Okay, let's look at the last one too, because I'm not sure exactly what to do with it. I like it, but I think it could be a little better, a little more interesting if we do something like that, play with it a little more. Um, and then cupping quietude, the antique moon. And again, so, so to the, I wonder, um, let me see some examples. I think we should show some examples of mono coup. Um like, like I had one for the Saiku not too long ago. It was um, hoping she stays warm tea, and then the warm tea does that that double duty where it, where it works is two ways: hoping she stays warm tea, and the cut can be there, or hoping she stays warm tea can be there, or just warm tea. So so it sort of blends over the other ones. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can find some good examples of Monoku. Monoku, yeah. So there's an essay from um, Wales Haiku Journal. Let me see if there's some good examples of Monoku here. Um, so an icicle, and this isn't, you're not going to be able to see this because it's too. Um, okay, so here, this is there's some samples of Monaco here. So we get um, an icicle on the moon drifting through it. An icicle on the moon drifting through it. And so the, the there's a do you see that way that that's overlapping? And so you both get the image being sort of overlapping, and then you also get the syntax of the sentence being overlapping, and that smashed togetherness creates this sort of this strange tension where you're like pulled in two ways and you're a little disoriented, um, but both is working at the same time. And so it makes it really like flower up and you can read it a lot. Um, my head in the clouds in the lake, kind of blue, the smell of rain, pig and I spring rain, interesting. Um, the theme scented morning lizard's tongue flicking out or the time scented, sorry, the time scented morning. So then here you have the time scented morning and, you know, um, the morning lizard's tongue flicking out. Um, blues change the color rain. Mallards leaving in the water rippled sky. That's Penny Harder who is in the Kurdish year of rattle, I think. Um, no moon last I remembered you were gone. Trying to make head or tail of another of an earthworm, <laughs> all smushed together. That's interesting. Morning glory sky. Yeah, sometimes you have these one word one word monoku too. Morning glory sky, all smushed together. A cold moon, secrets of the gallows. Between statues, the rest history. I like that one a lot. I like Jim Cassian. I don't know how to say that. Between statues, the rest history. 
But see how that's smushed together too. So you have a lot of uh, ways to do that. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I really like Undertow. That I don't know, playing with that. Um, Cupping Quietude, The Antique Moon. So this is the last one. We got we to gotta get going soon. But um, Cupping Quietude. I don't know. Cupping Quietude. Hmm. And I think quietude is, is a word that I, I'd find a better way to do. Cupping, I, I like the con. It's one of those things where I like the concept, but the um, the word itself could be better. I mean, even if it was just maybe cupping quiet the antique moon, or cupping, I don't know. Quietude is a little too, um, I don't know, a little too abstract. What if it was cupping the quiet antique moon? Cupping the quiet antique moon. What if we just, what if we cut the tood and move the the up here? Cupping the quiet antique moon. I think I would like that better. Um, hmm, interesting. But these are just, you see how much fun haiku are to play with? I, I really love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so Tom Brown says cupping silence. Yeah. Um, Terry R says, isn't it a good idea to avoid naming an emotion like grief in a haiku just to find a way, just find a way to give it with images? Yeah, yeah, generally. Um, um, what is the one? There's a, there's a Isa haiku. Um, that I, how does that go? Um, yeah, I can't remember the one I'm thinking of. So never mind. Let's just move on. Um, but there was one, or maybe I'm thinking of something different. What am I thinking of? The ocean weeping, the ocean. I can't remember. And I can't remember enough to Google it. Um, I thought it was Isa, but Google's not coming up with this one. But but there there are haiku that, that you, I mean, my point is that there are haiku that work really well that do say the emotion. I mean, every rule in the world is um, something to be broken. Um so, um, so you can definitely put haiku anytime you, uh, you, um, you know, say you shouldn't do this, that that's like, you know, I want to say, how can you do it? <laughs> you know, how can you make that work? And I, you definitely can. And, and, you know, going back poets have, hmm. so attractive faith says about this last one, I like cupping quietude. I'm not sure about how to see the moon as antique. It's older than antique and reborn every night, a permanent now. Um, well, I think I got the sense both. I sort of had a double sense. I kind of like the antique moon. It's similar to the um, the halo moon, which is a kind of moon you don't see. You see a lot of winter moons, a lot of harvest moons. Um, um, a halo moon is, is a little more rare. And then an antique moon, I haven't seen much, but I like the idea of that for the uh, sort of a, you know how sometimes it be like a red, dusty kind of moon. It looks kind of almost rusty. And that's what I imagined it. Um, and, and, you know, some of those, like, like that kind of harvest moon on a fall night, um, uh, very quiet, you know, um, rising through the trees that are cupping them. That's what I, that's kind of what I imagined with that. And so I imagine like visually it looking antique. Um, but then that it's also really interesting cause it is ancient and, and, you know, it's, so it is antique in a way. Um, even though in another way it's reborn every night as well. So, um, Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think that is it. So so that's what I would do. I think all these are really sort of really, really good, first of all. And then uh, pretty easy to make them even better. So interesting to look at these. Thanks for sharing them, Lisa. It's really fun to do haiku. Um, and a lot of fun to do this critique. We let it go on 26 minutes past normal. Hopefully the people who, who stuck around through the bad sound quality at first were rewarded. Um, but we did have, we had the, the series of haiku by Lisa Ellison, and then we had, uh, the bus, the woman knitting on the, on the bus at 7 a.m. or 7 a.m. bus. And then we had the two by, um, Kayla Pellegrini, who could just use more, more images, more concrete details so we can 
you know, have these real emotions and, and the cadence of a good, good, good sense of music, good ear for poetry, have that come to life with more details was the, the gist of that. So thanks to both poets for sharing their poems. Again, if you'd like to share your poems, um, feel free to do so. Just go to rattle.com or submittable, um, click on submittable at rattle.com. You'll see the haiku category, not the haiku category. So I got haiku in the brain now. You have the, um, the, the critique of the week category and uh, submit two poems there for critique or a series of haiku if you'd like. That's a lot of fun too. Um, I meant to say to Lisa too. I mean, I hope she's submitting these haiku because she's a really good haiku poet. And, um, you know, I do read every time a new issue of Frog Pond or Modern Haiku come out, I'd read those. I really enjoy that. It's different from the submissions too that I get all the time. I think it was one of the reasons I'm drawn to it is because we don't get a lot of haiku in submissions. So it's something different. And, uh, but I do enjoy, you know, Modern Haiku and um frog pond especially and um and lisa the, your poems are good they fit right in there already even without these edits which i think make them better so um yeah really good stuff hope you're submitting them to the to haiku journals and uh, that's gonna be it for the critique of the week today hope you enjoyed it thanks everybody for participating it was a lot of fun as it always is um let's see next week on the rattle cast we have who do we have next week oh we have sonia greenfield um, and her most recent book is All Possible Histories. She's also the author of Two Others Let Down, and I can't remember the third. Um, actually, it's four, because there's the boy with the halo at the farmer's market, I believe, which we don't have. But um, she has two books just come out just now, this and a chat book. Um, and that's the one I can't remember the name of. But she is like the the, the fairy godmother of Poetry Spawn or something, because she um, sort of kicked off the idea in my head, and she's had so many amazing poems. Just go to our rattle cut dot com slash respond and look for sony greenfield's poems the one about um um you know the one about um the the thoughts and prayers um you know being put out by by spokespeople um as if through a through a tin can <laughs> I mean, it's just great stuff so um so do uh stay tuned for sony greenfield the regular time monday january 7th, 16th at 8 p.m eastern the prompt for this week um, was given by last week's guest. And uh, let me just tell you what the prompt was really quickly because I don't remember. It was it was a little bit complicated. Um, it was to think about a time in your life when you felt most lost. What are the circumstances? We sort of brainstorm, write a little bit for 10 minutes, and then type into a search bar, if you don't, and then a letter. So if you don't are, for example. And it'll come up with a whole list of suggestions. Use one of those as the first line of your poem and maybe put a few of them in if you want. But um, if you don't R, or if you don't S, or if you don't P, that's the kind of thing. Type that into a search bar. Use the predict predictive text to figure out what the next word is and pick one of those to be part of your poem. That is the prompt for this week. Um, something about a time when you lost yourself using that technique. Um, this will be Rattlecast number 177 with Sonny Greenfield, Monday, January 16th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye.